Okay, I hope everybody's ready for a three hour tour. Because <laughs> um, that list, I have it very abridged and it could go on and on if it really needed to. Um, and I'm not even, I don't even touch on some things that I had hoped to touch on, but um, uh, what, you know, what do we expect to see in the winter here? Bulbs, so there's a bunch of bulbs on this a lot, uh, as well as a few other herbaceous plants that we're gonna see. Uh, and hopefully some of them are new to you and hopefully some are you've tried or will hopefully try here in the future. So. With, uh, uh, we're going to get started right away so that we can get through this as quickly as I can. Uh, hopefully we won't end up too far. We're gonna, the furthest we're going is just out in front of a, the lath house, but a lot of it's going to be right in around here. So uh, we're going to head right over here for our first plant. Here. So, okay, down here is our first plant. If anybody can, uh, most everybody can see me, most. Uh, or take turns in that case. This is Trillium maculatum. If I, yeah, maculatum. And this is a selection from Gainesville, Florida form, which is um, the species in general, it's found in the Southeast mostly, like Georgia, I think uh, Alabama and Florida, Northern Florida. And so this is from the southernmost range of it here. And this is a selection that was collected by um, uh, a local plantsman who's now passed away, Alan Galloway, and he shared it with us uh, several years ago, but it's already in full flower. Uh, so if trilliums, um, which I was reading, I didn't realize some of this, that doesn't have any leaves. What we see are, uh, that we think are leaves are actually bracts on the flower stalk, uh, um, which I didn't know that until I read that the other day, which I thought was really cool. I've always thought trilliums had three leaves and then three, everything's in threes. Well, the stem under of this is a rhizome and it's underground. And then this uh, inflorescence is the only thing that really comes up on them um, are, are made up of uh, bracts um, that are, um, around the flowers or uh, on an immature plant, it'll make a flower stalk without a, a blossom on it. So, but a bract and a leaf, um, where it's at in the plant. This is, uh, um, the leaf would probably come directly off the stem. And so this, this is not a stem. This would be like a, uh, this is a flower stalk. So this is a pedestal for all intents and purposes, which is the, the, the stem of the flower. And on here, on a leaf, you have the petiole. So this doesn't have petioles, it has a pedicel. Uh, and, uh, no, uh, and no petioles. So it's leafless for all intents and purposes. Exactly. Uh, so, but this has been flowering for a couple of weeks already. And apparently they can start flowering as early as, uh, did I say? Um, it's late December, and but typically for us here, it's late January. So, um, and this has been up. These were starting to push before Christmas. So these were up when we had that wonderfully warm weather on the 23rd of December. Um, and they were unfazed. And I was reading, theoretically, this species is only a zone eight plant. So, um, but that's kind of difficult to judge um, in reality. It's, it occurs in areas where they're of zone eight, more or less. It doesn't mean it can't take colder temperatures than that, which uh, technically eight or nine degrees would have been zone seven. But um, uh, we've also, we had, I think, how long have we had this? I can't remember. And where's my, I don't have a label. Oh yes, I do have a label. I have to look, I need to cheat. 15. So this, we've had this planted out in the garden prior to the last real cold spell we had prior to the, uh, December, which was 2018. And we got down to about three. And so, and that was in January. So uh, if I remember correctly, so uh, it got, it went through that unfazed as well. So these are some, oh, really good perennials. And I'm missing this whole cluster of them right here in the foreground. Um, so perfectly happy in our climate here and they flower super early. So any questions about this one before we head on? And hopefully the others who are at the back can glimpse these as, as you go by. So hearing no questions, we're gonna venture up the path and we're gonna end up going back in there. And it's gonna be crowded there, but I think we, might, we can have people on both sides of the mound here. Still a couple stragglers. Okay, I think we're almost here. So just for the sake, like I said, that there's 
45 or 50 of you guys here now. Um, if you want to come back here later on and review what we've gone over, you'll have a list. And you might want to make some notes because I, your list doesn't have everything else specifically what I'll talk about here. But the first one I think I put on there was Galanthospa, probably. Uh, because there's a couple different Galanthus back in this region uh, on this little pathway right through here. The first one is in full flower here. This is Galanthus naval or, um, yeah, navalis, which is your common uh, snowdrop. Uh, they are in full flower right now. This is uh, an unnamed selection that we got from Brent and Becky's. Wonderful uh, plants, and the, the Galanthus in general. Um, We've had Galanthus flowering now since, let's see, Olga region, or region A Olga uh, started probably in late October. And then it was followed by the early Elvesiais. Uh, this is a, a, not an early one. This is done flowering almost though. Uh, this is Galanthus Elvesii over here, which is a second one. Um, uh, it flowered about uh, over the last month or so. There's still a couple in flower here, but there's forms of Elvesii that uh, we have in the garden that start in early November and they're still flowering and some of them may end up flowering into the first of March. So what is that? Uh, November, December, January, February, March, uh, a good four months, maybe a hair over four months of uh, possibility of flowering from this um, bulb if you get the right selections. And there's other species uh, which, like I said, are in full flower right now. Um, so Navalis, wonderful little perennial. And back here, this is a different species and I can never spit its name out. It starts with a W and I need to, oh wait, I have it written down somewhere here. We're, it's Wuranoei. Um, it's a little different than those. I don't know if you can see the leaves on both of those species, Navalis and Alessii, tend to be a glaucous blue to me or a blue green. Well, these are a, almost a gloss bright green. Uh, it's a little bit different um, in that sense. Uh, we don't have any of the really crazy selections of Galanthus here, though. Over in there, there's some spent ones of Magnet behind this tree here, which are almost done. Uh, and it's a Navalis selection of that. Um, but uh, we have mostly species. And, but if you go over into England, they're crazy about their Galanthus and there's Galanthophiles. They will find the most minute difference in their Galanthus and select it. It might have a little green speck or it might have a uh, no green on it or, it's, it or it might have bigger uh, petals or extra sepals or something like that. Um, they've made literally hundreds if not thousands of selections and they will pay a mint for them. Thousand dollar bulbs, you know. Uh, it's almost like the, the tulip mania in Holland uh, during, uh, when was it, the 17 or 1800s when people went bankrupt. Um, it's not quite that bad, but kind of. So Galanthus are a wonderful perennial for us here in the winter and even late fall for that matter and early spring. And another great thing about them is that most things won't eat them. Voles don't touch them. The rabbits have not touched them. Uh, they're in the Amaryllidaceae, so, uh, or former Amaryllidaceae, which I think is now lumped into something else. Everything's been lumped. Um, but anyways, what I used to call Amaryllidaceae, and most plants in that family are pretty safe for us to plant. So uh, I won't say that someone might not come along and um, nibble on them, but most are safe. So great plants for us. There is a limited flower color though, typically white with some green. There's some white ones that have yellow on them too on rare occasions. Uh, so uh, that's your, your, your color palette in them, but they will take deciduous shade really well. Uh, so you can have them underneath the trees and they get winter sun and in the summer, it's so shaded, nothing else will grow. And these are perfectly happy because they're winter active. Um, the only trouble is with them, getting them established initially can sometimes be a problematic. Buying the bulbs, which you're typically, how do you buy bulbs? Dry in the fall. They don't always establish real well. Uh, Galanthus don't always like to dry out. Uh, so uh, you typically will get a handful that will survive. And from there, you can um, move them when they're in their leaf. Um, now, actually, th uh, this clump here would be a perfect time to divide it since it has finished flowering. I could divide that into 50 par um, uh, bulbs and plant them, and they'll almost all take without any loss. Well, if I uh, dried that out and moved it and planted them in the fall, you might get uh, a small fraction, a 10%, 15, 20% uh, of the bulbs will grow. So, um, 
You can't always find them in the green. So take advantage of when you can find them, buy them even in the dry and just plant a bunch of them and you'll get a few established and then go from there. Uh, any questions about Galanthus? So their common name is snowdrops? Snowdrops, yep. And we, you know, they don't get to be in the snow here very much, but, but they do excellent for us here. Yes, they, they mimic the snow. Uh, I don't think of snow drop, uh, as being droppy. They're flaky, but um, I'm from Pennsylvania, so um, where we get snow. Uh, yep. So the question was, do they, they want uh, uh, some sun when they're in the, uh, in the green? Yes, uh, but do they have to have it in the summertime? No, they don't have to have shade in the summer. But they, uh, I mean, they don't want to be in parched soil. So, but they, they'll take the shade. So that's the wonderful thing about them. Uh, you can grow them and have something there as a, a ground cover. At the time of the year uh, when nothing else is there, you know, they're like a vernal herb. They're like a spring thing. They like the cool weather. So they're there, you know, you can't grow a lot underneath that oak tree you have in your yard, even in the summer especially, but you can have something there to appreciate during the winter months, which, you know, down here, who wants to be out in July? <laughs> it's not as nice in July as it is oh, on this February day when it's 65 degrees. So, um, you know, they're wonderful for that time of the year. Any other questions? Okay, is my next plant a uh, Helleborus species? So in this area, I have a couple different, uh, or, and cultivars. Um, I have both some species and cultivars in this area. So, um, and it's not any of the, what I would call the hybrida complex that is widely planted. Um, we have some true species in here, and then these are some complex hybrids here. And we'll see some others later on, which I didn't put on the list, but we'll just uh, maybe touch on them in passing, depending on how much time we have. So anyways, back here, I can't spit this one's out without reading it. This, this one back here is um, Helleborus liguricus, which is from the nor northern coastal regions of Italy. And I have not done this. Let's see if I can find a fresh flower. Supposedly it's fragrant. Actually, it is. It smells fruity. So if you get a chance, come back up here. Um, it has green flowers. Nothing spectacular in that. But what do you see on that? How are the flowers held? They're, uh, they're held up high, almost ab above the foliage. That's another th characteristic this one is known for, is that it holds its flowers above the foliage instead of so many hellebores are down in their foliage and you have to really um, cut them back to see the flowers real well. Uh, so that's a really cool one to f uh, try if you can find it. It's not readily available uh, everywhere, but if you have the, the, the opportunity, try Helleborus uh, liguricus. And then over here, uh, is another lesser uh, known one. This is uh, a tiny one and you'll have to come back here to see it. Um, this is Helleborus uh, croaticus and this is a selection that Tony Avent named um, from uh, a seedling that he got from, oh, who's the, did I write down the guy's name? I did not. Uh, anyways, there was a well-known Hellebore plant uh, guy who introduced this selection or a seed strain, and then Tony selected this one. Uh, it's called Bell of the Ball, and it is a really nice dark form um, of Helleborus croaticus, and it uh, it's just a much more diminutive species. Uh, it to goes totally dormant in the summer or late summer, so the the leaves will die down. They're not in the way, so. Come back whenever you have some time later on and look at this one. It's a much more diminutive species. Uh, the flowers are just a, a little about an inch across. They're not the big gaudy uh, modern hybrids. Um, let's see, I don't think I put this one in here, but this is one I found yesterday that we thought we had lost. This is per, uh, 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 Helleborus purpureus, which is another one. Um, Actually, Croaticus purpureus, uh, li uh, I can't, Liguricus um, orientalis. There's a whole complex, which next month I'll be talking, I guess, on uh, digging deeper about hellebores. And I will dig deeper into hellebores then. But these are all very closely related. They're acolescent species. They don't form a, an actual stem above the ground, more or less. And anyways, 
Um, they're in a, all closely related, and they may, that's where your complex of hybridus uh, comes from. So also in this area, there's now three clumps here still of this one here, which we've had for several years. This clump still looks so much better than those two right now, but uh, this is Helleborus Eric Smithii, and um, it's Koshin 798, and I forget what its trade name is. I don't have it on my labels here. It, oh. Uh, Shooting something, we're cut off. It's a too long of a name, but it's the trade name. But anyways, these are much more complex hybrids. Um, Eric Smithy eyes are crosses between Helleborus sternii, which is a, a lividus, a Helleborus lividus crossed with Helleborus argutifolius. And then they took that hybrid and they crossed it with the Christmas rose, Helleborus niger. And you get these really cool hybrids, um, which are very floriferous and they're nearly sterile. So those other hybrids the, it, with um, these other species that I showed you earlier, they tend to be hyper fertile and you get seedlings everywhere and they can be problematic. People are starting to worry. Maybe these are going to be invasive. So you don't have any worry about that with these. Um, and uh, they tend to just, uh, they stay where you put them. They aren't going to multiply. I hate to say it, you can't share them with your neighbors as easily, but, um, but they flower for a very long time. Uh, another one of these type of hybrids are back here. And this is one, um, this plant, uh, the original of this plant was planted in our winter garden and it had been planted by, um, uh, Judith and um, oh, <laughs> Blake, remind me, um, Dick Tyler, thank you, the Tylers of um, Pine Knot Farms, um, which are the Hellebore Nursery, uh, uh, just over the state line in Virginia. And they thought this was a wonderful selection. They came back, I'm going to say about 10 or 12 years ago, and dug it out of the garden, and they tissue cultured it. And they got it out commercially, and they named it Ralston's Remember. Or Ralston remembered. So this is a Helleborus Bellardiae, which um, is a lividus, so it has uh, times a niger. So it's basically that minus the argutifolius. So um, it's another complex hybrid. They don't sell so everywhere either. Uh, and they flower for a really long time. Really nice foliage. This is more reminiscent of uh, a niger to me in the foliage. That has a little bit more stems to it, which is probably coming from the argutifolius uh, side of things. Um, okay, also in this little area here, um, I don't, you won't be able to see them, but there's, because it's on the wrong side, that I have a uh, cyclamen in here. Uh, there's actually three different types in here, which um, right now, right here is one that's in full flower. There's a cyclamen coom here. Uh, they're one of the winter flowering cyclamens. They have really nice little rounded leaves to me um, with a Christmas tree on them most of the time, but they can uh, have wonderful foliage. They can be silvers and stuff. And then we have over here, uh, this is a cyclamen heterofolium, which I love for their winter foliage. This is just a simple greenish uh, uh, one as well with a little bit of silver patterning. But we'll see some other ones later on that are even more spectacular than this that I like. But they flower for us. They don't flower for very long. I've seen them as early as you know, late May, a handful of flowers through the summer. During a heavy flowering in um, October, November, and even into December a little bit. And then... The foliage is there all winter long. Uh, the flowers will be just there in the, the summer and uh, fall, early fall. Um, but the foliage on them, as far as I'm concerned, is worth growing them as a winter perennial as anything. Uh, uh, and I'll show you another selection at our next location we head to, and it's a silver leaf one. And I just adore it. So, um, and then over here, there's a freaky one, which I had to look up. Uh, it's not flowering right now, which I know, I, I kind of know why it's probably not flowering right now, but this is a Helleborus hetero, uh, heterofolium over here crossed with a hetero, uh, a, a, not Helleborus, I'm sorry, cyclamen heterofolium crossed with cyclamen grecum, which is the Greek, uh, uh, cyclamen. They both flower in the fall, so this one's not flowering now, but the leaf on it is really cool again. It's different than either uh, Grecum or um, Heterofolium, and we have both parents in the garden, but they didn't, uh, that, this hybrid did not occur here. And it's the specific epitaph they've given it, which I could not find for anything yesterday when I was looking up information, was uh, Whitey A. So it's W-H-I-T-E-A-E. -E. So I was looking up... Um, Cyclamen whitea, and I was finding jewelry. No, 
I was finding white cyclamens. Never mind. It was something else I was finding jewelry for later on. Um, but, so I was finding only white cyclamens, not white EA, which is a specific epithet, not uh, a color. So, and if you do come up here, there's actually a couple other little cyclamens, or not cyclamens, uh, trilliums up in here. Uh, there's one over here, uh, Ludovicianum, um, and over here there's another one, uh, Fortidissimum. Uh, they're both from a very uh, similar area. They're both found in Louisiana and Alabama, but in different areas of Louisiana and Alabama. And they're associated with two different subsections within trillium. So they don't cross, but um, take a look at the foliage. They're not quite flowering yet, but they'll be flowering in the next few weeks. I actually see buds on this one. And yep, this one has buds as well. So if these, uh, some of the things I'll show you today aren't quite in flower, but come back over the next few weeks uh, and observe these. So I got most of you here. Uh, what I'm gonna show you here actually isn't the hellebore. It's this ground cover right here. Um, this is one of our natives actually. This is a native of the Southeast and there's several other species that are native that they aren't quite ground covery as this one. But this is our cardamony. Um, may have known it also as a dentaria is the old name for the, uh, this. These are in the cabbage family of all things. And uh, I did taste some a couple weeks ago. I, I can, it tastes like maybe like radish greens or um, there's a little bit of pepperiness to it. So you probably pull out cardamines. If anybody had bitter crest or winter crest growing in their garden as weeds, that's cardamine, I think, Car Caroliniana. It's one of the cardamines. There's some for several different states. So I, I, uh, anyways, next kin to this, but they're annuals and weedy. This is a ground covering species. It comes up in the fall and it grows throughout the winter and it'll go dormant in the summer. Um, at this time of the year, it's really nice for its uh, uh, trifoliate leaves, and which has a uh, really nice venation on it. This is a specific selection that Tony Avent made, which he collected in Alabama. So it's, uh, what did he call it? Bama Jamma, <laughs> of course. Um, and it was one he found growing in a, a seasonal floodplain. Anyways, which was a little typically wetter than normal for what he would thought you think of for seeing the species. We have had the species in the garden for years, but not this uh, selection as well. I have one uh, that we moved uh, inadvertently with another plant, and it's in the front bed out here. Um, uh, and it has made an enormous patch. Just a little piece came along. Wonderful ground cover. You won't see it at all during the summer. But uh, in late winter, early spring, you'll start to get some uh, pale pink flower spikes will come up on these as well. Um, and most of the plants, there's uh, just a really nice, I don't know, purpley tinge to it as well. So I do like it for that. Just the texture. It's again, it's one of those vernal herbs that are there during the fall, winter, spring, and then are gone for the summer. Um, so that's this cardamony. There's another one over in that area, which it's not up enough for you to really to see as being with this big a crew. I won't even worry about showing you the actual plant, but um, it's one I found yesterday in the garden. I knew it was here. Um, Doug had planted it, I think, in 2020 during the, uh, uh, the COVID, and he didn't accession it or plant it in a record, but I knew it, what it was, thank goodness, and I figured it out. And <laughs> so it's now in our records. <laughs> Anyways, but it's a different species. It's not one from the United States. It's one from Eastern Europe. There's Cardamity quinquefolia, and it's coming into bud. It's just pushing up, but in the next two weeks, it'll start to flower. And it's a soft lavender pink to me, uh, or mauve, I, they're not mauve. <laughs> Oh, anyway, it's a soft color, and it's much more spectacular in flower than this. The foliage is much more cut. It's Cardamony quinquefolia, um, and it's from Asia Minor, Bulgaria, the Caucasus Mountains, Iran, uh, Southern Europe, Turkey, and it starts flowering in February, and it'll go into April. So uh, it just, it bridge, it's one of those nice bridge um, species for us here. And again, it's winter active and it goes summer dormant. He actually has it planted around, uh, with, among hosta. So before the hosta comes up, this cardamine is there. And then when the hosta uh, expands up, the cardamine goes to sleep for the summer, which is a really good use of space. And it's a ground uh, um, covering species as well in that it likes to sucker. So um, over, right over in there. I'll point it out here in a little bit um, when we're over here. So uh, come back and see that in about two weeks, probably. It'll start to flower. Sure. Yeah, they're not heavy flowering. Oh. It's more as a ground cover with the bonus of a few flowers. Okay. Yeah. 
So I don't think I have this listed on there, but um, so someone mentioned Helleborus Anna's Red. Uh, that's what this one is here. And there's a couple other Hellebores dotted along over here as well. I can't remember all their names, but, um, oh, actually I take it back. One, uh, so Anna's Red real name is ABCRD02. Uh, Isn't that so catchy? Uh, Anna's Red is the trade name. And then there's an, uh, one of them over here. I don't remember which one from here, but we have EPB30. Uh, which is Frost Kiss Dana's Dulce, uh, Dulce. And then we have EPB29, uh, another catchy name. Uh, Frost Kiss Dorothy's Dawn. And that might, no, that's not that. But all of these, um, I don't remember. I have to find it. And it's in the record somewhere. Oh, actually, what's that label right there? Nope, that's the Piper. I found it the other day, I thought. It might be the, the, the Dana uh, Dulce. But anyways. What these are known for, uh, they're from a breeder out of uh, Dorset, England, and he does, I was looking, he doesn't let you know anything in their breeding, but I can make some guesses, I think, and, um, but they have some really cool leaves. The leaves, even before they flower, are spectacular. They have uh, silver or pink veining venation on them. He's been selecting for. But what, if you look at the patents for these, he says they're hybrids crossed with hybrids. They aren't the same hybrids that I consider what I would call uh, um, Helleborus hybridus. I have a feeling they're, uh, they have some Niger in them. Say they have some uh, Lenten rose in them. Um, they're really different. These aren't straight hybridus. Um, the flowers on these tend to be nice outward facing and held well above the foliage for the most part, but you get the wonderful leaves. And if you look at the ones down here, you can see some different colored. These are a lot redder. There's some more pinker uh, ones over here. Um, just variations on the, the venation. So um, that's what I wanted to point out here. They, um, th they're also sterile. So these are ones, if you want to have a mass, you have to plant them. And that's what we had the opportunity to plant a mass of them here. And um, they're starting to take hold and they won't take over your yard. So, well, if you turn around right behind here, I had mentioned the cyclamens for their foliage and you can see up close. This is my favorite strain that we have here in the garden. This is a cyclamen, uh, let's see, Ashwood Nursery Silver Leaf Strain, or Silver Leaf Ashwood Strain, I can't remember. Something like that, it's Silver Leaf, yeah, and um, it, yeah, Ashwood Nursery Silver Leaf Group. This has been an excellent selection, or series for, or not series, but seed strain for us. Reliably silver, occasionally we get some green ones in there, but beautiful during the winter. I could care less if there were even flowers during the, the, the late, uh, the summer and fall on these. Uh, just grow them for their foliage. And that's a great thing about this cyclamen. So another thing here, um, a serums. So um, are the, the wild gingers, even though this is an Asian one, this is not our native ones, which a lot of people are now lumping into, or breaking out into a different genus, Hexastylus. But this is actually in full flower right now. And let's see if I can get any of these without mutilating them too much and pass around a few of these. This is um, a Serum Maximum Ling Ling. And this is a selection that was made by Ozzy Johnson uh, in Georgia. Uh, of, uh, it's an Asian species and I'll uh, pass these around. They're really cool. They often call these the panda uh, gingers. And I think you can see why. And now, does anybody remember the, the original two pandas that we had at the National Zoo? It was Ling Ling was one of them, and I forget the other one. But anyways, that's where that name came from. Uh, these are something you have to get down to appreciate. Uh, but they are really cool. And these, like I said, these are in full flower right now, but you, can't, you don't necessarily notice them because they're in the foliage. But if you do take the time, they are a great dry shade perennial and nothing eats them. Deer don't eat them. Rabbits theoretically don't eat them and voles. So can't go wrong there, can you? Um, so these are just, like I said, some really cool plants. Uh, just take the time sometime when you're walking back out, you can um, look underneath their leaves to uh, see those blossoms. Any questions about any of the plants in this area? Marilyn. 
they wouldn't be, uh, okay, Marilyn is asking about the serum. Okay, she's asking, do they have to have dry or will they work in moist? I would just say so it's well-drained. It doesn't want to be wet. They're not going to be a boggy species. Any other questions while we're here about cyclamen or uh, the cardamines or the acerums? Okay. The acerums, what do they do in the summer? They are evergreen. Those don't go dormant. So uh, you're seeing the old foliage right now. There's actually a whole new flush of foliage coming up that'll come up right after those uh, flowers. So I was seeing them when I was down there uh, digging a little bit. So any other questions? I've had things. You have? Lucky you. No, I mean, actually, these are great. Uh, uh, but theoretically, that's why I say there's always an exception. That rabbit might not eat it sometimes. It might just chop it off. Uh, but, you know, and spit it back out and keep on munching until there's nothing left. Uh, I, that's what I find with rabbits. So, um, But, yeah, theoretically, deer and rabbits don't bother your serums. Theoretically. There's always that, like I said, exception. Okay, we're going to head to our next location, which is going to be over that away. And so over here, now, what was that thing, that symposia that's coming up? Tossing out the turf. Tossing out the turf. This is our flowering one, which has been here now, I think since about 16, maybe, 2016-ish. Uh, um, which we've killed all kinds of things in here, but we have some bulbs planted in here as well uh, as things uh, that take over the ground and cover it up. Um, and so these are some small bulbs that actually work uh, in, uh, in a grassy landscape. Um, they're ones that aren't gonna, don't want to be overwhelmed. So in here, what, do, what genera do I have first on my list? Crocus? Do I have crocus? Okay, crocus spus. Which there's actually several different uh, crocus in here. Some of them actually flower during the fall, uh, but there's some winter crocus in here. Back in here, there's just a couple, which I don't, the squirrels probably took them. Uh, they love our crocus most of the time. But I, th I think these are some Thomasinianus, which I'm not even going to worry about. Everyone has Thomasinianus, but there's some stranger crocus in here. Um, this one over here, I think, is one that, oh, let me see, where do I get my right sheet of the paper here. Do, 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 do. Where did I go? I had it earlier. Oh, I might have forgot that sheet. Anyways, darn. Oh no, here it is. It's, there's a little yellow one here in this yellow leaf thyme over here. Uh, crocus coral kawai. K-O-R-O. L K O W I I, and it's an alpine species, uh, uh, subalpine species um, from the mountains of uh, Kosovo, Afghanistan, northern Pakistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. So it stands, um, and supposedly have two different selections in here, and I can't tell the difference between them, and if they still exist in here. But anyways, there's this nice little pat soft yellow one right here, uh, and full flower over here, and it's been flowering for like two or three weeks actually. Uh, it's been uh, taken. Uh, uh, an advantage of the cool weather we've been having, and it's been uh, holding on really well. Uh, and then hiding in here, do I have Colcha come next or Narcissus next? Narcissus. So in here, there's actually a couple different Narcissus. One's not quite out yet, and I, I'm not remembering which one it is at this moment. But anyways, um, I could, the one I wanted to talk about is this one right here and at my feet. And it goes the whole way down in there. There's a couple of them. This is um, one of the bald uh, or the, the hoop petticoat tights. So this is white petticoat. This is a hybrid between um, Narcissus cantabrica, I believe. Is that how you say it? Cantabricus, which is kind of a creamy white, hence this coloring here. Crossed with a really well uh, flowered, uh, heavily flowered selection of Bulbacodium subspecies. Obesis, 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 uh, diamond ring. Um, and it's, these have done very well for us here in the, uh, and flower heavily. They're just starting and come back next week. These will be in full flower with the warm weather. Um, adorable things. And these have done great here in our flowering lawn. So, uh, they will also do real well, say in a, um, um, a, a, uh, a rock garden type situation. These do not want to be in the shade at all. Um, the other one over here, there's a junk 
cool type over here, which is just coming into bud. And I don't, like I said, I don't remember which species, but I like some of these uh, um, smaller growing species uh, and hybrids of Narcissus, not the big uh, traditional Narcissus uh, that have the, the cup, are daffodils. Um, I couldn't grow these back home in Pennsylvania real well. You didn't see Narcissus jonquillus types and bulbocodiums, but down here they do great. They just do want more sun though than, uh, than some of the others, um, being that they're a little bit more diminutive, um, but they often have wonderfully fragrant flowers as jonquils will. I don't know about the bulbocodiums to tell you the truth. We might see. There might be a faint fragrance. It's not overly fragrant, but if you just want to pass that around to uh, get a closer look at that little bulbocodium. Uh, type flower there. And if you look really close, I was definitely not expecting this large of a crew. Um, there are a couple little plants right in front of me, right here, here, here. And they, they're getting a little eaten up, but these have been flowering for about two or a week and a half now. And it's really surprised me. This is the colchicum that I have on there. And let's see if I can say it. Uh, so boliferum, so boliferum. For, um, yeah, uh, which is a colchicum, which most of the time I think of colchicum as being fall flowering. And that's what most of us grow are the fall flowering colchicums. Uh, this is one of the spring, spring flowering species, uh, and it's much more diminutive than the autumn ones, which are so much more gaudy. Um, you get the hybrids now of those like water lily and stuff that have enormous couple, uh, three or four inch cross flowers. Uh, but this is just an adorable one. And, um, uh, we had the opportunity to plant here a few years ago, and I actually had it marked dead until about two weeks ago, too. <laughs> when I noticed it was in flower, and it's like, oh, I killed that two years ago because I thought it was gone. I hadn't seen it. So, okay, we brought it, we resurrected that on our records. So, anyways, so that's just a cute little one to appreciate right there. No, I didn't. You don't find those everywhere to get to plant new ones. Any questions about any of these uh, things in this zone here for winter perennials? Okay, so we are gonna take this little trail over here and, um, or you can go back, actually, why don't we just go back up and we're gonna end up right where that little trail ends. How's that? I think, so is my iris, yes, yeah, so this is my iris is what I want in here. And I, yep, yeah, those weren't open yesterday. So you can see the ones that were open um, over the weekend that got um, hammered by the freeze on uh, Friday or Saturday morning, Friday night. But um, so right here in this area here, we have our iris here that I wanted to talk about. Um, this is iris win uh, ungu unguicularis, uh, winter echoes. Um, this is one of the winter flowering iris, the Algerian iris, and supposedly they're fragrant. I don't know. I'm not getting it right now, but maybe at different times of the day. But anyways. Uh, this is a selection that was made by, let's see, I found the, the breeder of this one. Let's see, uh, Richard Tasco, I don't know where he's from, but he introduced this one and, uh, and registered it with the Iris Society, which everything, that's a big society. Um, there's tons of Iris, but anyways, in 2011. So this is actually a fairly recent hybrid that's been introduced, or selection of Ungulcularis that's been introduced. But beautiful uh, deep purple flowers here. And these have been flowering off and on probably since um, late November, early December, and these will go into uh, at least March, and if not into April. So really long flowering uh, period on the iris and glicularis, or winter iris, or Algerian irises. And um, so being Algerian, you, okay, it's from the Mediterranean area, and so they're accustomed to hot, dry summers. Uh, they want well-drained soils typically, uh, but they can take a little bit of shade. They, um, as well as um, full blazing sun with no problem. Um, and there's other forms of the species that are found on some of the other Mediterranean islands like Crete and things like that. So um, that are often a little bit more diminutive. And if you look at, uh, around, you can find, a, they're not easy, not like the bearded iris, which every store has and every um, uh, catalog has, um, but you can, if you get to uh, specialty nurseries like Plant Delights Nursery, um, or in, in other, uh, especially iris nurseries, you may be able to find some other unglicularis, which would be great to try growing here. Um, they uh, are a little bit more finicky though than your bearded iris, but, um, but well worth the challenge. Any questions about that one? What do I have for time? I might, I'll talk briefly about this one. This, these here, there's actually two different hellebores here. Um, 
These are, again, this is one of the other uh, complex hybrids. These were what I think probably the Anna's red, it's the ones up there are very similar to this. These are called Helleborus glandorfiensis, uh, and these are, oh, Cosa 4100 in this case, and I don't remember what that one is. Uh, that one I don't even know the real name of, but this, is, this one is Ice and Roses Red, and that's Ice and Roses Rose. And I couldn't find the real name for Ice and Roses Rose. We don't even have it in our records because we can't find it. But these are crosses between, oh, uh, let me see here, Eric Smithy eyes. Uh, so let's see, was that the first one we saw? Was it an Eric Smithy eye? Yes, so that first hybrid that was up on the mound was an Eric Smithy eyes crossed with a, a hybridus. So that group of, that complex group, which is made up of those other early ones I showed you there, uh, are in that group of acolescent species. And they've incorporated uh, those characteristics and you get these very large flowers. They're very early flowering. We have some other selections from the same series out uh, near the necessary in the old uh, Lawrence border. And they are just spectacular right now. They've been in the ground about a year longer than these. And um, they hold their flowers up uh, well above the foliage. They start flowering earlier. There were flowers early November on some of them up there. It's due to the Niger in them, so which is the one parent in the Eric Smithy eye side of things. Um, and you're, but you're getting some of these really intense colors, great foliage, they're being long lived and they're totally sterile again. So uh, they're not gonna take over your forest. So I uh, just wanted to, their tissue culture or division, which uh, someone asked me earlier, how uh, can you divide hellebores? You can, they hate it, but you can do it. And if you're gonna do it, I would probably say fall and early winter as they're coming into growth, not something you'd wanna do in the spring actually when they're going dormant and they just sit there and sulk and maybe rot away during the summer. So um, any other questions while we're here? In a clump, you can move them, but you will still wanna get a good root ball. Um, okay. Okay, we're gonna head down over into Asian Valley. Actually, we're not. We're gonna go out onto the patio or the, the uh, terrace over here just briefly to pick up a plant over there. Okay, we're on, I, uh, if you can see down here in the foreground, there's some greenery. Some are almost done and there's some bright yellow ones here. These are aconitum, or not, they're winter aconites, not aconitum, I'm sorry. They're aranthus uh, hyamalis. Uh, this is uh, one of the winter aconites, as like I said, and they like cold weather. So they're uh, getting them established here is the challenge in uh, finding a place they like. Um, and originally, I don't know how long ago I planted these. Do I have a number on here? Yes, I do. In 2014, I, I planted these probably. Um, I planted about 50 in here, and I think I ended up with a handful at most that actually came up. Uh, they were dry tubers um, uh, or roots um, planted uh, in probably in December of 14 or early January of uh, 15. And um, like I said, just got a handful to take and I've been so happy they're starting to self sow in here. Um, and I was, uh, these are um, a little woodland plant from the Europe, um, found throughout Europe. And uh, they do like to naturalize when they're happy and starting to get it. I don't know, there's actually literally hundreds of seedlings now popping up in here. Um, and hopefully in a few years, this whole area will be just a solid mat uh, in the winter for us of yellow flowers. And they've been flowering for about, oh, I think since about the second week in January, I started having my first flowers over in here. Uh, and that one looks fresh right there. And that one right there is perfectly fresh as well. Uh, so we're starting to get them in here and doing real well. If you can find them, um, again, these are kind of like the Galanthus. They are hard to get going, but once you get them going, if you get a few, they, they're happy, uh, they're great, and will be there forever. Um, you see pictures of them in England and stuff with both Galanthus and uh, Aranthus just covering the ground. Um, uh, but just wanted to point these out. These are in the buttercup family, and you can probably see that. So these are actually next of kin in reality than to the hellebores. They're all in the ranunculaceae, which is the buttercup family, so. Um, not too much to say about these other than they, the seed only germinates when it's cold. And that was something, that's another thing with them. Um, they, they, the seed doesn't germinate until it gets around 40 or less. So um, 
we don't always have that and our winters are getting more mild. So we need our, those cold nights. And I'll see pictures of these people on Facebook saying, oh, these are already in flower. They flower earlier further north because they've had more chill, I believe. And they actually need to get the more chill before they're actually open here. It'll be January and they'll have had them flowering in December um, and we haven't had any yet. So uh, any questions about the little Aranthus? Pardon? How do you make them? Uh, there, I mean, actually, I'm thinking this might not be ideal here because it's probably too warm because it's south facing. I think I'd need a, it'd probably be great on a north facing slope um, in uh, summer shade. I mean, again, deciduous shade is great, uh, but they want to stay cool to last longer in cooler conditions. Um, too, so uh, and flower longer. So if you have a north facing slope or north side of the house, try them there. Don't put them in that. They don't need the, t the pampering to put it in that warm spot in your yard. <laughs> Any other, uh, Marilyn? That I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know on rabbits and deer if they like eating these. They, my guess is the rabbits will come and nibble them off, but they haven't done it here yet, but I don't have that many. And this is rather open. So maybe the rabbits are afraid to come over here and fear that the, ra the uh, raptor, or whether, uh, I don't know if I have owls in here or not, but I do have hawks. Uh, <laughs> I like my hawks and I'm always happy to find out, to see droppings that look like coyote and fox. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I haven't seen any rabbit damage yet that they like a lot of my other stuff. But they are, again, they're in the same family as the, um, um, the hellebores and another plant, the last plant that I think will probably hopefully, or second to last plant we'll hopefully get to. Uh, let's see. Okay, it looks like almost everybody's here. Um, so our next plant here is um, Epimedium, and this is Stellulatum, if I remember right, if I have enough syllables there, because yesterday when I was typing it, I was forgetting a letter. And where do I have it on my list? Oh, there you go. So anyways, this is uh, a wild collection um, here that um, Scott McMahon from um, down in Georgia collected several years ago, and we were able to get a, a division from. And, this is just a beautiful little specimen right now. It did get some damage with the, about the, the mid twenties that we had the other um, on Saturday morning, which I expected us to have way worse. I then was hope, uh, afraid this was going to be totally melted, but uh, this has really surprised me. I don't know that I've seen this one flower quite this early. It would normally flower in February, but later in February. But this has been flowering for about a week and a half. Uh, so it was, well, it was the end of January this year. Uh, so uh, anybody knows about Epimedium? They're typically deer resistant and rabbit resistant. I won't say vole resistant, but maybe. Uh, they come at them from the bottom, you never know. But um, does anybody know what these are? Oh, without looking at the, uh, the, the uh, name here. What family these are, what plants these are related to? And something else that flowers right now, actually, in the garden. These are in the barberry family, so Mahonias. So this is in the, the same family as barberries and Mahonias. Um, and I always find that really ironic. And I think um, uh, th they're herbaceous barberries is what I say. So these and May apples, uh, for instance, are also in the same family. But um, I just love this one. This is Stellulatum. And Stellulatum, I looked it up, and it said that it is a Stellu, um, I think, or, uh, means little or tiny stars or stellar or tiny stars. Oh, it stellula. And I did not put an R on this, but I had autocorrect and it put, it put an R, it put stellar, um, <laughs> stellular. But um, anyways, it means tiny stars. And that is a perfect description for the flowers on this one. Not all of your epimediums have this um, delicate of flowers. Some of them have um, more multiple spurs and stuff on them uh, in different colors, but this has just been an adorable one. And we have a couple other that we received as different species or unknown species. There's one up here in Asian Valley that's just starting to flower. And I have half a notion to think it's another st uh, stellulatum, um, but um, this has just done beautifully this year here, aside from a few um, flower stalks. So you'll be able to file by, by these next couple here when, as we go, but the next one, which is not on your list, is a serum uh, subglobosum. 
which it, you have to look at this one. This is, we saw the Aserum out at the um, entrance and they were in flower, but this one's so much easier to look at right here. And this one's totally, it's a different color. This one has really dark eyes, uh, but I just love the flowers on this again. Uh, this is one that's from Japan, from uh, the Kyushu region of Southern Japan. And again, it's flowering in the winter and it has just simple uh, leaves. The leaves aren't as pretty as those on maximum, but um, I like the flowers on this one. It's a little more diminutive and you don't find this very often. This is one Tony Avent gave us. And another plant here that you might look at just as we're going by is another of the species, um, hellebores. Uh, this is Viridis. And what does Viridis typically? Green. green, yes. So this is a truly green one. So this is a, a good one for the month of March, not for February, but um, <laughs> for St. Patty's Day instead. But this is another of this, the, the species which is involved with all those complex hybrids that, that we call the hybridas. Um, and you can just see that here. These do not sell so everywhere. There's actually three plants here and these were from... Not, not a lot. Your, your true species tend to be much less fertile than the hybrids, which oh. they, when they cross in hellebores. So I've been told. To these aren't hard to grow at all. Uh, but we have had, we have another, these were from seed that we were um, uh, from a guy in England who collected these in the wild um, several years ago now. It must've been 2009. And um, there's actually three different plants here. And this one's up already. This one's just pushing up uh, in bud. And then this one's just barely up. But we've had some other Viridis in the garden in the mixed border for decades now, and there's no seedlings around them. So yeah, they're much better behaved than their 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 kids. Whenever you cross them all out, and they and they're, they're super fruitful. But uh, anyways, those are just some to appreciate as you go by. And there's another one which is going to be a little bit off the path. And I think um, I'll just point it out. There's some high uh, straight. It's wild collected from the same guy by the same guy who collected that. Um, Helleborus niger here, which this flowers much later than the typical niger. Nigers are often flower in no, uh, late November, December. So, uh, but these are just in full flower now. So um, I just wanted to point those out, but we're gonna head out here and just over onto this side over here. These are a little tattered just because of the cold nights we had, but they'll be fine and dandy. But we have some, um, Anemone here, Anemonium coronarium. They're Mediterranean in origin, found throughout the Mediterranean. And um, this is one, uh, this is Mount, Mount, uh, Mount Everest. So this is a white one. And there's a couple different groups. There's uh, several different groups within the species. But anyways, um, I'm finding, I really like these. These are some that we thought, we tried to dig up and we missed. The ones we dug up and then replanted did not survive as well as the ones, that, there are a handful pushing up, but um, the ones we missed are the better ones. They start growing in the fall and then they flower off and on in the winter into m early May. So, um, this is an enemy coronarium, and they're just getting started. These are the poppy or uh, windflowers or anemone wind uh, um, uh, or poppy anemones. But they'll get about a foot, uh, 15, 12 to 15 inches tall. Beautiful when they're in flower and they're just starting. There's some purple ones over here. I cut them, <clears throat> I hate to say it, on Saturday, or on Friday before I left work because I thought they were going to get decimated. Uh, there's some in here, uh, but it's a group of plants I really appreciate. I, have, I haven't had any rabbits eating them. Uh, uh, um, Greg was telling me he planted them and the, the rabbits adored them. <laughs> but they've been good for me here. Here's a purple one just poking here. There's another one. Um, and we threw the ones in that we had dug the year before. Um, these have not been ever dug since we planted them. But there's a few of them popping up, but they're much later. I do not know why. Um, and so we'll see what happens. Uh, they're the same bulbs, but um, they're just scattered along through here and we'll see what happens. But I really am liking them a little more than the anemone blandas, which are much smaller. Um, uh, these are great cut flowers when they do uh, uh, get going and you can cut them and the flowers will last for a week or so. In, uh, in a vase, and then when they go to seed, the, they're poofy. And I've actually had some seedlings too pop up over in here. Uh, so an another plant I love, um, and like I said, I haven't had any issues with the rabbits, and we have major rabbit issue here. Something that's not quite flowering yet here, but I'll, I, if, we might just wander this other way. Um, I just wanted to mention them, but the Iris reticulata group, they're uh, pushing up. I have one in flower in another spot, which 
if you follow me on the way back, I can point it out to you. But this, these are just starting. This is Alita. Um, so these are your dwarf irises. Uh, and they've been doing quite well for us here. We have some in the Scree Garden that have now been there since 2007. Uh, and then these have been here, I don't know, let's see, can I read the accession number? I can't read the accession number on it anymore. But these haven't been there that long. These have maybe been seven or eight years. These have been right in here. Uh, there's a couple over here. Uh, uh, it's a per deep purple one. This Alita is a soft, I'm going to say a denim blue kind of to me. Um, uh, so I like that. And uh, I mean, they, they're they just so pretty when they're in flower, but it'll be I'm just going to say maybe next week we'll start getting some over here.